I am Arno. I am the CTO at Thingcell, and I'm responsible here for all the research and development. And uh, if you're starting as a developer, you will certainly have a lot of interaction with each other. You will also have other senior developers as mentors, but um, we will certainly be in close contact. Thank you. I'm Volker. I'm one of the senior developers at Thingcell, and together we will today answer all your questions about the company. Um, I was uh, doing my PhD at Georgia Tech and uh, then I wanted to find out what to do with my life. By the and, way, uh, that was 20 years ago. Uh, yes, that was 20 years ago. That was in uh, 2001 and I, or 2002 I finished my PhD. In uh, 2001, I did an internship at McKinsey, and there, um, to find out what to do with my life, whether I would actually want to go into management, but it turned out I didn't want to go into management, but I, there, there were many consultants, highly paid people, who were like hunched over laptops, and they were pushing around PowerPoint chips. And I had just done a PhD in computer vision, and uh, we had programmed many complicated algorithms, and it was kind of weird to see people here struggling with something as basic as pushing around PowerPoint shapes. So it was quite natural to say, well, can't we do something? Can we help these people writing software that, that makes, them, makes them faster doing that, doing pushing around PowerPoint shapes? So you want like this little green man that pushes around PowerPoint shapes. And, and notably, notably, PowerPoint doesn't offer anything in that regard. It offers you like uh, all bells and whistles and decoration, uh, but it doesn't really help you with arranging a slide. Right, so, uh, so that was actually something that things are set out to do. And, um, and yeah, so that's what we've been doing until this day. And uh, I, th I think it is very nice to know that uh, we have a large user base and, and people take delight in using the software and that we can help them. And uh, that kind of justifies our, our efforts. I mean, if you put so much effort into a product, you also want to build something that's actually being used. And uh, it's nice if at a party people come to you and say, hey, you have a great product. The most important part of the technical stack at Thingcell is definitely C++. Um, almost everything we do is written in C++, including our web server, including the backend, all the, all the backend work, so not the actual product only. Um, and we use the Visual Studio compiler on Windows, and Xcode, on Clang, like Xcode with Clang on, on Mac. The product is both on Windows and on Mac. So it's true cross-compiling code, and that's something to love uh, from a developer's perspective. Right, so we have about 95% code commonality between uh, Windows and Mac. And uh, on top of C++ alone, we use some libraries. There's, most importantly, there's Boost. And we also have our own library that um, is also open source on GitHub. You can take a look at it if, if you look for things so on GitHub. And it, among other things, contains a range library that is a little bit different from the C++20 range library. It is by and large compatible, but uh, has a little bit of a different philosophy. And then we have, in terms of libraries, we also have CLP. That's a, a linear solver that helps us with some layouting problems. And finally, um, what we do also involves some reverse engineering because we want to get deep integration into PowerPoint. So that means we use IDA for reverse engineering the PowerPoint and Excel executables, or Windows executables as well, and to, to integrate deeply to, so, to the way this works is we identify places that we want to change in the code. We really have to understand this, this large code base. Which so is a, think, I think it's of things that as a virus. Which, uh, in a way, so what we do, we would probably do if you if you work at like virus scanner companies um, or something like that, where where you really have to understand. In this case, the, the office binary is just a whole lot larger, and to understand it is is is, is very difficult. And um, so this is this is something we do with IDA. And then once we identify the places that we want to modify, we we pick out patches, we pick out little snippets of code, and. Um, because of course these binaries, these office binaries, they change. Um, they are updated quite frequently. 
And we don't want to change our patches so frequently. So what we just do... Just like a virus. Just, just like a virus. And uh, what we do is uh, we, we take little snippets of code and we scan the binaries when things are starts um, in, at runtime. We scan the binary and, and find places to patch and uh, then, then make the suitable modifications in the code. And, um, but Ida, I think, doesn't work on ARM, does it? Well, Ida works on ARM. Um, we, we do have the, the, the disassembly, the, we have little disassembly built into the code because if you want to, if you want to match code, uh, in particular, when you want to hook functions, um, when you want to hook a function, the way this works is if you find the beginning of the function and then you disassemble away a little part of the beginning of the function, put it somewhere else, so you can patch in your job right there. And for that, you need a little disassembler. And uh, we wrote our, for, for x64, um, we, we bought a license, but for ARM, we actually wrote our own, so we have our own little ARM disassembler. Um, then, what else do we have? Well, we were talking about technical stack. So, some of our technical tools are Jenkins for nightly builds, certainly. And also, you shouldn't forget, uh, forget the uh, bug receiver, which we uh, grew in-house. Right, um, so this is an important thing. Uh, to, of course, quality software shouldn't have any bugs, right? So, how do you know about bugs? So, we have telemetry in the code that phones home whenever we encounter a problem. And most certs, assertions stay in the code. So, when they fire, they phone home. And these things are categorized in a, in a database. And you can, as a developer, you can, you can bring up all the categories and you, look at, you can look at each individual occurrence of, of these categories. Including, um, including a stack trace. Including the, the, the mini dump. The mini dump, yeah. So you can load this into the debugger and, and take a look what happened on the customer machine. And uh, once you fix the problem, you can actually mark the problem as fixed in the bug receiver. And when this problem is encountered and on the customer side, then the customer will actually be notified of, of an update. So, and then this update... Or the update will, actually installed uh, silently, which is a very cool feature of ThinkSat as well. Right, so uh, we actually can actually um, install updates silently to the, the, um, without actually restarting PowerPoint. The, uh, the, the software will update. And, uh, and we, can, we also have a very elaborate infrastructure um, of how we control um, updates, they, they, they trickle in so that they, when you set a new version for updates, they don't, um, not everyone gets updated at the same time, so in case you have a problem um, with the update, if there's a problem with the version, you don't have this tsunami of, of uh, support calls, but it starts off with a trickle and, and you hopefully notice quickly um, that something's wrong. I get this question quite a lot. So, uh, of course, I mean, we are a company, right? So, um, we wouldn't really be in business if there, if there would be any problems. So, no, there are no problems. So, uh, why is that? Well, the thing I think that, that people think of when they think about legal problems, in, in particular with the reverse engineering aspect, um, is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And it, it specifically outlaws reverse engineering with the important exception of reverse engineering to enable interoperability between different systems. So in this case, it's PowerPoint and ThinkCell, or Excel and ThinkCell, and they have to work together. And the purpose of our reverse engineering is exactly to enable this interoperability. There's good cooperation with Microsoft, um, and of course Microsoft has a lot of interest in, in providing a or in, in having a good ecosystem, a, a thriving ecosystem for the Office product. So and we are part of that. We usually find a task that is not too involved with the existing code of ThinkCell. That is a little bit on the side where they can get their feet wet with, with ThinkCell uh, without diving straight away into, into all of ThinkCell code. Um, so quite frequently there are also several options and, and uh, that you can pick. And certainly I also want to find a task which is, which is fun for you, which you're interested in. And, um, then some examples, um, if you, for example, we, we replaced an XML parser 
that we had a Microsoft XML parser and we switched over to XPad. That was one project uh, that someone did. Or a new color picker. So, so far we use the built-in power color picker of Windows and uh, we wanted to build something a little bit more fancy. So uh, this was also a project that someone helped to do. Another recent project was an uh, ODPC wrapper to make uh, to create an in-house API for our own purposes. Right. So the, the, basically, for database access, before we used ATL, like an old um, old ETB ATL um, component for database access, and uh, we wanted something cross-platform. So when um, it was it was ODPC because that works on Windows and Mac. And uh, we created like a, a nice generic programming rangy wrapper for OPC. Yeah, and that's something you can be proud of when you've done it yourself. So that's uh, usually these projects are scoped in a way that you are a full owner of the, of the code and you don't have to sit there all by yourself. Of course, you get guidance as much as you need, but ultimately it's your code and um, it gives you the opportunity to shine. Well, because we have too few. Uh, I mean, very, very good developers, and, and at Thinkcell, I think we have excellent developers, are just very, very hard to find, and, and we can never get too many of them. So we will always be looking for more. And it's, it's part of the, I think, this obsession with, with quality and, 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 and quality code and beauty in the code that drives us to really look for the very, very best developers. And, and this is a constant search. This is, this is like our, one of the, the most important things that we actually do as a company is, is look for new talents. At the same time, we never run out of projects. We have so many ideas we could implement and users are, they love Thinkcell, they give us feedback and they always ask, can't you do more? So there's not a shortage of things to do to further improve the product. And um, most of those things are actually quite challenging, and that's also why nobody did it yet. And that's what we want to hire you for. I don't think there is a particular skill that we look for in C++ developers. I think any developer who is, who is smart and who is working in a, in a structured way, who is able to analyze the problem and come up with a well-justified solution, a, a well-structured solution, is, is, is very much able to work in, in many different contexts. That's at least our experience. So we don't look for any particular skill, we just look for smart people, good developers in general. And certainly some experience with C++ is advantageous. We also found that experience doesn't necessarily result in, in excellence. So even if you are if you if you have a lot of experience, that's great. If you don't have experience yet, then you can always get it at Think Cell. If you are a really good developer, I think you are you will you will make it and, and you are certainly welcome and, and you will be a great addition to the team. Well, I mean, the primary thing you will do at ThinkCell is programming. So it makes a lot of sense for us to test that skill first. And that's what we are doing with this automated test. And with the, the, the testing, also we, we try to make this, this test fair. So a, an automated test is, is much more easily comparable compared to an interview you have, which is, which is per se always subjective, depending on who is interviewing you. So in order to keep it fair, we also you know, subject everyone to a comparable test, um, and which is then, then automated. And I also see that um, the, the communication skills of developers vary a lot. And there is certainly the option, if you're a very good developer, uh, to get hired at things that even if you are not the best communicator in the world, that's okay. There are still, you know, it, it depends on the task, and some tasks require great communication, some other tasks, not so much. And uh, the focusing on the programming skills right from the start allows us to, you know, not filter out the people who would be great colleagues, but uh, only because um, they, they are not the best communicators in the world.
Well, I mean, of course, we are doing this test to be as realistic as possible, right? So, at ThinkCell, we don't have any deadlines. We are usually relaxed. Um, we are not expecting people to work under pressure um, or to work under a hard deadline. So, why would you do that in a test? So, what you really want to test when, you, when someone is programming is how they would later work. And so, we give people enough time to, to work on the problem in a, in, a, in, a, in a structured way, to take the time to pay attention to details, to produce beautiful code, and to, to, really, um, to really finish the code in a, in that, that they are, so that they're really happy with it. And, and then submit it. And so we don't want to impose any one of these, this, this, such a strict deadline. And so we just give people time. That's why you have nine hours. Which usually you don't need. So people sometimes uh, hand in a solution after two hours, but don't feel too safe because uh, you have the time, so check your code, double check your code. And also don't worry that we will take your solution and commercialize it without you participating. Um, our uh, tasks are taken from the product. So we, when we find a pr problem, an interesting and tightly scoped problem uh, or an algorithmic challenge, um, then uh, we sometimes take that from our code and uh, turn it into a programming challenge for the interview. Uh, it's not the other way around. There is no fixed limit, really. Um, so anyone who is really good gets hired, I think so. In practice, we may hire up to maybe five people a year, but that's not because there, there is any limit. It's just determined by the number we find. And so if you are a really good developer, you will get hired. By now it should be pretty clear that ThinkSell puts a lot of effort into recruiting and that because of the high quality bar, it is, we, we unfortunately are in a situation that we only have very few people who we actually hire. Now, this means if you are getting hired at ThinkSell, we will do everything that you need to make your relocation to Germany, to Berlin, as painless as possible. You are free to pick when is a good time for you to come. There's not going to be any pressure. If, if you need more time um, to, to get things organized, that's entirely fine. We will help people with relocation costs. We will help people with apartments, with uh, language education. And so we will really try to, to make you feel comfortable. So, um, and we are very, very thankful that you are working at Things uh, in Berlin. And if you are from some remote location, from German perspective, um, don't worry. There are 17 nationalities at Things that are working right now. Um, they came from all over the world, including places like New Zealand, Chile, Brazil. So wherever you are in the world, if you think that this is the place you want to work, we will make it happen.